I went through a sports management program at Wakeland High School in Frisco, and I did an internship last year. They're going to look at you like, you did an internship? Yeah, I did an internship. The good thing is, is that he's also cultivated relationships with sports management programs in college and professors and stuff. So the word's kind of getting out that this program exists. You know, it's up to you guys if you want to take advantage of it. Chase went to uh, South Carolina for a visit for their program. And when he went up, he said, do you know him? Chase went, LSU. And he asked me, he said, well, who do you know? Mine? Yeah, that's yours. He said, who do you know? And I said, well, I met a bunch of people from South Carolina at the National Sports Forum. And they knew about the program and everything. I said, well, I called them, said, hey, he's coming up. They said, well, when he's here for his visit, have him come see us. He was on his visit and on the general tour. They said, I have a meeting. And they kind of looked at him like, well, with who? And he told them. And he said, well, who are you meeting with? And he mentioned the two names. One was associate professor and the other was the department head. And they're like, oh. And so he went and met with them. Yeah, I mean, here's another example. I know somebody that uh, wants to transfer to Texas A&M, sports management program. It's supposed to be one of the best in the state of Texas, okay? And they started talking to different people they networked with, and then found a guy that knows one of the doctors that teaches in the sports management program. Again, networking, asking questions. Don't be afraid to ask, hey, you know anybody in A&M that can help me out? You know anybody here that can help me out? Don't be afraid to ask him. Hey, I'm thinking of applying to tech. Do you know anybody in tech's athletic department? Or when you get up to Oklahoma State last, next year, you turn around to him or email him and go, hey, I'm up here, I'm in still water. Um, I'm going over to the athletic department tomorrow. Do you know anybody I can go talk to? That's how it works. Okay. The intern that was at Learfield last year is going to tech this year, mm -hmm. and tech is a Learfield property. Yeah. So now all of a sudden they get to go over there when they get on campus. I guess they just started last week, but they get to go over there and talk to them and see if they need help. And now they're going to get a reference from corporate. Right. You know, and I'll tell you, what I tell kids that are coming out of college, I really don't care where you went to school. I don't care if you went to Harvard. I don't care where you went. But what I want to see my resume is, is your resume showing me that you're going to be passionate about working in sports. And how a resume shows that is, have you volunteered, have you worked in, for your school athletic department, have you done any internships? There's nothing wrong with being a cashier somewhere. But when you graduate from a four-year sports management program and that's your experience as you were a cashier at a department store, it's not really helping you out in trying to get up the ladder for a sports management job. Whereas if you worked at the athletic department at school, or you did an internship between your junior and senior year, or you have this person as a reference because you met them from your networking, which one am I going to look at more? The second one. Okay. So just kind of keep that in mind. And I know some of you might be sitting here going, well, geez, we're in the first week of school my senior year. I get it. And this is a fun year, and enjoy it, and life will change next year. But if this is something you want to do, you have to start looking ahead a little bit. Okay? And it's only going to help you if you start looking. Don't look back. You can look at today, but well, what can today do for me in the future? How can I? So look ahead. Well, I'm in high school now, but I've seen that these three schools have great sports management programs, and that's where I'm applying to. And now do I know anybody there? Well, can I get a job in the athletic department there? Is it in a city where I can get an internship during the summer? Or do I have to come back here to get an internship? You start thinking ahead like that, so that you want to put yourself in the best position you can put yourself in when you graduate. College. College. So the thing you should say about coming home for internships is, you guys, when you, I'm getting internships for you, that's leading from last year to this year, and they're established or I'm getting new ones. 
but if you start to look at professional organizations, the, the interns that are starting now, they've been interviewing in December, in the spring for the fall. So they are almost a half a year ahead in getting people lined up for that, and you have to be aware of that. Yeah, you can't put in for an internship two weeks ahead of time. It's already filled. Like, if I'm doing a summer internship at Stocks in Maine when college gets out, I'm talking to those people in February. So kind of keep that in mind. That's the time frame. Okay. Um, and even for the internships, do you know anybody there? Do you know somebody who knows somebody there? Think of that, too. Okay. So, I'll, uh, I'll stop talking for a little while. I'll let, who's got some questions? Anybody? Don't be afraid. See, this is all part of it. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Yes. That was a little bit unrelated, but I can't help but notice your ring. Is that a Dell Star Championship ring? Yes. That might be the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't take I have it. A huge stars now. Late, late in plays for the uh, the Dallas Penguins U18. Yeah, well, you're not, you're not put it this way. I, I know you're not going anywhere with it, so. Uh, <laughs> talk, 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 talk to them about taking constructive criticism, and it's, talk to them about constructive criticism, how it's not, cons, it's not criticism, it's helping guide them to do things more so the proper way. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, when you get feedback on stuff, it always tends to touch on the positive and focus on what you perceive as the negative. And granted, it is the way it's presented, depending on the person. But most people are presenting it in a manner that you learn from it. So whenever, I just had this happen yesterday with my intern. I asked her to write an introduction for our newsletter about the Soccer Hall of Fame over here opening up next month and the festivities that weekend. And she brings it in to me, and it was written in almost like a very straight news style and didn't have the details that needed to be in there. So it's a teachable moment, and it's a learning moment for her. So I said, listen, read this to yourself, and then ask yourself, is there a wow factor there? Would you want to keep reading the continuation the way you wrote it? And she saw what I meant. And I said, so take this back, jazz it up a little bit, make people want to keep reading. So it's a teachable moment. So don't, yeah, remember that the criticism isn't always meant to be, it may come off negative, but it's, but it's usually some type of teaching moment to be able to help you improve what you're doing. Shy. Talk about uh, doing. Well, I, mean, I want them to ask. I'll give you one. I'll give one more, and then they can think about. It. You guys need to ask questions, right? Talk to them about yeah responsibility and jobs that you're going to have, and you might be doing some of the bad jobs, and you might not think that you should be doing those bad jobs, but you need to understand who would be doing them if you weren't there. A hundred other people. You got to remember one thing. I'll give you an example. So the American Airlines Center put up a entry-level marketing position back in uh, March. No. When was it? It was spring. They took it down after two days. 150 people applied in two days. That's how competitive it is to break into this business. And the marketing director turned to me and said, hey, so-and-so put in for this, and they said they know you. Yeah, she interned for me a couple years ago. She's really good. She got an interview because of my recommendation, and she got pulled out of 150 people. She ended up finding a different job and dropping out of that job search. But it's, they'll find somebody else in what Leon's trying to get across to you. No job is too small. No job, you know, I'll use the counting t-shirts example. You know, every company's got little things that need to get done. And unfortunately, the interns are those people.
people that do the little things, or those people that are just started a full-time role. But again, showing the do what it takes attitude will help you make the impression. Yeah, they did that, they didn't question it, they did it, they did a great job. They counted it, they gave it to me in an Excel spreadsheet. It's all sorted and labeled in the storeroom. Boom. And eventually you'll start getting out of those little jobs, but that's what part of what an internship is about. Okay. What else? Yes. So at the end of your career, how did you get into the Rangers organization? So it was a a step process of I'll take it back to college. So working in the sports information office in college. The guy I worked for knew the Red Sox PR director, because the Red Sox PR director used to be the SID at the University of Massachusetts. I had him call the Red Sox PR guy. There's no email or texting back then. We had a call. I had him call the Red Sox PR guy for me. He put in a recommendation. I put in a resume. I went and interviewed. I got that position. Through that, I met different PR directors around the American League when they came in to play the Red Sox at Fenway. And then internship ends in November. I'm looking for a job and I get a phone call in February from the Rangers PR director. My assistant's leaving. I want to talk to you about the job. He knew who I was because I met worked with him. He'd gotten a recommendation from my boss at the Red Sox. And I went and interviewed. He ended up interviewing five guys that were all interns around baseball that year. I got the job. The other four guys all got jobs the same year. And that's how I ended up with the Rangers and moving to Texas. So um, it's that step process of building upon every opportunity you have in front of you. And networking, making the right impression, doing what it takes, put it all together. And that's how it. So luckily for me, I never worked. A lot of people have started minor leagues or colleges and end up moving up. I was lucky. I ended up going right into professional. So. Yes. Would you say it's more common? For people to build themselves up, like go from minor league, like all the way up, or just start off and move through the same? Um, I see both. Um, you know, there's this this old definition of the word luck. It's when opportunity meets preparation. You have to be in the right place at the right time, and you have to be prepared with right background, the right references, all that stuff. So whether you're in minor leagues or starting in major leagues, timing is huge. The position that we're hiring for right now at the Sports Commission is the first full-time position we've hired on the marketing side in four years. And you know, I've had people ask me throughout the years, well, are you guys going to add to your staff? And I said, well, we'd like to, but the timing's not right. Now, finally, the timing is right. Um, so I've seen it both ways. I've seen people come up that kind of started in the majors and stayed in major leagues. And I've seen people start in colleges and come up to majors and, or stay in college and progress through the ranks in college. Or people that have been in the minors and have, you know, with minor league sports teams that have moved up to major league sports teams too. So, there really isn't a secret sauce for it. It's just being in the right place at the right time and being prepared. I, my situation was I went back to school after working in the NHL, got my degree. That was right after the lockout, 95. So nobody was really hiring in the NHL. I got a job in ECHL, AA in Alabama. Went back from working in the NHL to working in AA. But while I was in AA, Doug Armstrong called who I had known from back in his Capitals days, then he went to the North Stars and then he was in Dallas saying, hey, we need somebody. And I said, when you need somebody, he goes, three weeks. I got here the day before the season started against Colorado Avalanche in 97. They got on a place, said, hi, bye, left. I had worked with Hitch in Philly. 
And it was like you said, being in the right place and knowing people and him saying, just update your references, have them call me and we're good to go. I didn't even have to come here for an interview. I was hired. They called my references and they said, yep. And he said, here's here. be here in two weeks. Well, that's what that was it. It's the way it is. Yeah, I mean, that's the way it works. You know, that's the way it works. I mean, if you've done a good job, done the best you can, and, you know, have people go to bat for you, that's usually the mm -hmm. best way to do it. back in the late 80s and early 90s, so it was before any of the social or web streaming or any of that. So your marketing back then was based on getting people to come to you. Um, there are many more objectives now with the different online tools and the money involved. When I started with the Rangers, the highest paid player on the team made $600,000. I know to you guys, it's not, I know $600,000 is a lot of money, but compared to what these guys make today, so Scott Fletcher, Scott Fletcher was a shortstop for the Rangers, made $600,000. Actually, no, Char, it was Charlie Huff the first year, the pitcher, the knuckleball pitcher, and then Scott Fletcher in free agency the next year. So $600,000, and we all thought that was unbelievable, you know, and then, uh, it, you know, now you've got guys that are making thirty. And, um, you know, I was telling somebody, we were having a discussion at lunch yesterday. If you go to a Cowboy game, you know, it costs you $80 to park. Well, parking at Arlington Stadium back in 1987 was three bucks. You know, tick, you get in for three, you get in for another three bucks. I mean, for 10 bucks, you could get a ticket, park, hot dog, and beer. I mean, it was, you know, now for 10 bucks, you can't even sniff the place. So, you know, it's, uh, but back then, it was very, but it was very based on ticket sales. So getting people to the ballpark, um, and you know, it was tough when that old stadium, when it was, you'd look up at the school board clock and it's 10 o'clock at night and it still says 99 degrees, and you know the team wasn't that good. So, uh, well, that's, that's like a great. You can get people to come every fifth game when no one was. Well, yeah, I mean, we would go from 17,000 on a Tuesday night, and then Nolan pitched the next night, and we'd get 40. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, they, all came to see him. they all came to see him, so that was the greatest marketing tool we had. It was when Nolan pitched a home game. You know? So, that was the big difference between them. Yes? Are you going to be in, like, cool athletes? Yeah. 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 Well, that's... Yeah, so part of what I used to do with the Rangers and the Stars as the PR director was, I was the guy that dealt with the players. So anytime the media wanted to interview a player, uh, opening up a locker room after practice to the media, uh, getting the players to do any type of player appearance, charitable little event, things like that, um, it was all funneled through my department. So um, I've been very, very fortunate I've met a lot of great athletes. I mean, in baseball from Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio and Hank Aaron and Willie Mays. I've, you know, I've met these guys and uh, Nolan Ryan I worked every day with for four years. Um, you know, on the hockey side, we, you know, I, when I was with the Stars, Brett Hull was there and Mike Madonna and Belfour and all those guys. But then I've also got to meet I've been lucky I've got to meet a lot of guys that I idolized growing up. So I grew up in Boston, my idol was Bobby Orr. Like oh, awesome. And I've been very fortunate I've gotten to know Bobby through my time in the NHL. He's a great guy. It's even better when your idols are awesome guys. These guys are great. Um, but you all, you know, it's been, everybody loves sports. You know, so you'll get politicians come to games. You'll get actors and entertainers come to games and things like that that you get to meet. Um, you know, I, I've been lucky to where I've, I've met three presidents in the United States while they were president. Um, in 1999, after we won the Stanley Cup, we got to go to the White House. 
I have a picture of me with Bill Clinton. 